And still with me is Conservative commentator Chloe Dobbs and journalist and broadcaster Matthew Stadland. Um, we're going to talk a bit more about water companies and particularly we had a long discussion during the break about our favourite Easter eggs. We're going to come on to that at the end of the show. But before we do, let's talk about this new law that's coming into force in Scotland. So in the Socialist Republic of Scotland, as I like to call it, they have brought in a new law and I'll read out what the great offence is. They say they're having legislation that reflects speed freedom of speech because if you say something that could cause fear or alarm, which is a completely subjective view, uh, you could have committed a criminal offence. And I asked myself, why, when we have a knife crime pandemic around the UK, including places like Scotland, where we have most burglaries going undetected, is the Scottish government passing a law saying that if you effectively offend someone, the police have to get involved? And there's been a report today in newspapers, but particularly on Sky, saying that there is a fear that this new law will be used to settle scores between people. Because if you have a subjective law about a criminal offence, I was offended by what you say, I had fear and alarm, then you report that to the police, they have to follow up on it. And I saw this a little bit, my friends, during the COVID pandemic, because as a member of parliament, you are often contacted by people about neighbour disputes or fallouts they've had with people down the local pub, and they all change from neighbour disputes to COVID breaches. They weaponise the COVID regulations to make reports against each other. I'm sorry to say that is part of human nature, but what the Scottish government is doing, it is giving people a tool they can use to settle a score. Matthew, do you think that's a reasonable analysis of it? It may be going a little bit far. What I would say is a defence of this would revolve around the difference between causing offence, and you're, I think, conflating offence with abuse, perhaps, causing fear and alarm. There is, it seems to me, some sort of important difference there. I mean, I've got a thick skin. I honestly, I'm not a, an MP, but I honestly get trolled by more accounts on X, formerly Twitter, than anyone I know. Probably even more than you did when you asked whether Easter eggs <laughs> were being released too early in the supermarkets. So I've got a thick skin, but lots of people don't. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why are people trying to cause each other harm? Yeah, or, but it's, I suppose why, the real question alarm? is whether that takes over into being a criminal offence. In my view, it shouldn't, but joining me now is Helen Joyce, author of Transgender Identity and the New Battle for Women's Rights and director of Advocacy at Sex Matters. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Are, are you concerned that this law may be weaponised? I'm certain that it will be, and that is what the women that I work with in Scotland are very worried about. The fact is that there have been campaign groups who um, trans rights groups that have for many years been saying that to call a man who identifies as a woman a man is hateful. It is also true, by the way, and it is also the status in law of any men who have not got gender recognition certificates stating that they're women. However, there are lots and lots of people who think that stating biological reality and legal reality is hateful. So we're absolutely certain that lots of those people will be reporting us. And the point then isn't what the safeguards are once it comes to court, it's what the police do before that. And if the police, who have also been trained by these trans rights activist groups, think that it's hateful, they can take your phone, they can take your computer, they can sit on them for a long time, they can make it impossible for you to work, you will have to get yourself a lawyer, uh, you will have uh, worries hanging over you, your family will too. That is absolutely what we are certain will happen if this goes ahead as expected. Well, it is going ahead, but it rather begs the question, you know, what on earth are the police for? If I misgender someone, I wouldn't do it intentionally. You know, I'm sure you wouldn't do it intentionally. You're talking about the law as it stands and the facts as you see it. But why on earth should that become a police matter? Because what you're really talking about is people being offended by what has been said rather than necessarily being in fear or alarm of, of their personal safety, surely? Exactly. I mean, to be honest, I might misgender somebody intentionally. If it's somebody, if it's a man who's trying to come into women's spaces, uh, then I might have to say, well, this is a man. That's why he shouldn't be in women's spaces. And if he thinks that's the equivalent of using a racial slur, or if that puts him in fear and alarm, uh, that's his problem, not mine. I'm the one who's <laughs> needing to protect my rights here by saying that men aren't welcome in women's spaces. And yet this wrong, wrong training and this promulgation of the idea that a man's feeling that he is a woman overrides women's rights to single sex spaces 
means that it will be turned upside down. And lots of the police believe this too, by the way. We've seen this. We've seen in the recent weeks, trans activist India Willoughby reporting JK Rowling to the police, saying that because JK Rowling pointed out that India Willoughby is male, which India Willoughby is, that that's a hate crime already before this new law. Now, the police haven't investigated, but I think they would yeah. in Scotland under the new law. And also they will record non-crime hate incidents against you. But you don't Helen, necessarily this, know that that's be, happened. Just to be clear, and I can tell you you're absolutely passionate about it, it's not just li uh, limited to the debate around sex and gender and women's rights. It's really anything that anyone says which someone regards, and it's complete. What I have concerns about this is completely subjective. And what one person regards as offensive, if it becomes a crime because they are offended, clearly that is wrong because it may not be offensive. It, I'm sure it is in most cases is not a hate crime. It shouldn't be a matter for the police. It is not just limited to what you say. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any faith in the Scottish government because they have a bit of form on this because when they were talking about the Gender Recognition Act and, and the other things they've done in the space, particularly around gender, people were saying, well, you may have a situation where a violent offender uh, transitions and seeks to go to a woman's prison. And we were said, that will never, ever happen. And of course, it did. It was a national story uh, just you know, last, last year, I think it was, and it did. And we're being told by the Scottish Government, you may have all these concerns about this bill, but the SNP Green Coalition is saying, all of your concerns are completely unfounded. This will never happen. But they've got form on this, haven't they? And that's why people we should be worried have. about it. Because what they say and what actually happens, what people who apply common sense to this and say, this surely can't be right to, to create a subjective criminal offence, what they say and what ultimately happens, we've seen before there's a big gap between those two things, haven't we? Yes, both on this issue, because by the way, it wasn't just after people warned them that it had happened, it had already happened. There were already violent men in women's prisons in Scotland. So we were talking about something that had happened, but they also have a habit of passing extremely bad laws that end up, uh, end up being overturned on constitutional grounds, um, like the, the Named Persons Act. Uh, so, you know, these are not people who take care, who listen to their critics. This law was passed in 2021. I first wrote about it in 2020 when I was still a journalist at The Economist. And I said what a, uh, you know, what an anti-free speech law, how authoritarian it was then. It's been almost three years since it passed it, before it comes into force because the police said, we expect a, an avalanche of ill-founded cases. We haven't got the training, we haven't got the time, we haven't got the manpower. They still haven't trained all police officers in Scotland. And by the way, this covers people all over the UK. If it's read in Scotland, it's published in Scotland. Wow. So you're not safe just because you're outside Scotland. Any Scottish person can, or anyone based in Scotland can make a, you know, an absolutely aggravated claim against you with no base. And the first you might know of it is that you're applying for a sensitive job like a care worker or in a school and you don't get it because there's a hate a non-crime hate incident recorded against you. Do you know what, I mean, Helen, I really don't think that this law is constitutional. Helen, I wasn't aware of that. That is terrifying. So yep. someone watching this show in Scotland, we have lots of views in Scotland, could say something that I or any of the panellists have said and it would create a criminal offence in Scotland. That, I think, is shows this creep against freedom of speech. It's absolutely chilly. Helen, stay with us, because I want to bring our panellists in to ask any questions or talk to you as well. Chloe, I mean, sure. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. That is really, really worrying, no, isn't I it? I wasn't. That is, is terrifying. It just shows just how draconian these new policies that Hamza Useless, as I call him, is bringing in. This really is like something out of 1984. Um, the work that uh, Helen and the other Sex Matters done is fantastic at showing um, how this and all the other trans madness is, is really quite um, damaging. Now, one thing that I noticed, I'm not sure if, um, if Helen noticed this, um, on the list of uh, things that you can commit a, a hate crime on the subject of, it looks like transgender people are protected, but women are not. Uh, transgender is on the list, race is on the list, etc. But gender or, or sex is not on the list. So it seems like this is protecting transgender people, but not actually women. Uh, which is quite concerning. That's correct. Uh, can I just jump in? Uh, there a crossdresser is explicitly protected. Yeah, Matthew, you wanted to come in. But I, I can understand some concerns about, as it were, mission creep against freedom of speech, although that's clearly not what is, I, I suspect, motivating 
the lawmakers here, and I'm no fan of the Scottish Nationalist Party. However, I just do want to say that what Helen said when she, and I'm not suggesting it's criminal, but what she said when she called India Willoughby, who is recognisably, and I, I, I think as far as I know, is legally a woman, to call her a man is a, is a disgraceful thing to do. It's a biological well, Helen, male, well, let, let's, born a biological I think Helen male. Can, I think Helen can speak for herself. Helen, um, would you like to respond to that? Sure. India Willoughby is a man who has a certificate for saying he's a woman. That doesn't put any obligation on me whatsoever. It means that he'll be treated for pension purposes, for example, as a woman. It doesn't mean that I have to recognise him as a woman. If you look back at the Hansard debate at the time of the Gender Recognition Act, that's completely clear. There were people who said, but what about other people's perceptions? And people said, but the law does not impact on other people's perceptions. So, you know, you're giving me more, more reason to worry here that you think it's hateful to say that I a man think is a woman. Hateful. I think it's transphobic. My protected and, belief, and my protected this... gender critical belief, my protected gender critical belief is that men cannot be women. The Maya Forstatter case established that that is a protected belief. Well, the so law as it stands disagrees with you. The law of the land, no, as it, the law of the land as it stands, disagrees with you. No, it doesn't. And I cannot no, see why you would want to call. I un cannot understand why you would want to call a trans woman a man, if not for hateful purposes. This is old-fashioned transphobia. So you're just let me let me finish here. because we're living in a no, democracy. Hold on, hold on. Apparently, don't, I want to have please, my Please, Matthew, say. just don't, please don't all speak at once because our, our viewers and listeners want to hear people. Matthew, you finish, and finish, Helen, yeah. I'll give you the opportunity. There, there, to come back. There, there, I I understand as a man that I should be humble when it comes to issues of of women's rights and women's spaces and so forth. Right, I I totally understand that because I am not. I don't feel under threat. And there are reasonable conversations to be had where trans rights and women's rights may come up against each other and clash. There are, of course, very important discussions to be had about what children should or shouldn't be allowed to do. All of those, by the way, should be done sensitively with children at the heart, not to be part of cultural wars. But to call a trans woman a man is just offensive, it's hateful, and it's old-fashioned transphobia. You did say it's illegal, Matthew. I didn't say it's illegal. I, I'm sorry, but the right, well, let me let, let me sorry. bring Helen back in. Helen. No, let me come back. Yeah, yeah. of course. OK, 5,000 people in this country have a gender recognition certificate, and India Willoughby has said that he is one of them. So all the other ones are, in every respect, biologically and legally, men. Uh, from what you said, I think it sounds like you think that it would be very rude, at least, and possibly criminal to call them men, but that is what they are. Uh, gender critical beliefs are protected under law in this country, and it is my right to express my beliefs. It may be your right, uh, but I don't believe that any men can become women. So it's, Helen, it's not I just hateful. Want to put a question to you before it's done to protect Chloe... women's rights. Helen, I'd just like to put another question before I bring Chloe back in, who I know wants to come in. Uh, are you saying that the, those um, gender critical beliefs you have, which are protected under law, you say, uh, within the United Kingdom, after this law passes in Scotland, will you still be free, without criminal sanction, to express the beliefs that you can do uh, under law today? Nobody knows what will happen, but I bet I'll get reported. And as they say in criminology, the process is the punishment. So being reported is no fun and it may have impact on me, but I care enough about free speech, I care enough about truth, I care enough about women's rights that I'm not going to stop saying these things. So let's see. Chloe, you wanted to come back in. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on the fact that you said it was transphobic to call India Willoughby um, a man. Now this, the phobic, the thing that we put on the end of a lot of words, this suggests that there is something irrational of it, like for example, arachnophobia, say irrational fear of spiders. This is not irrational, there is clear reason behind it. Um, to to say that this person is a woman is to deny biological facts. Now, if you don't think that biological facts like being born with a penis matters, OK, fine, but don't force it upon other people. We should be able to, for example, as Helen has pointed out, in female spaces especially, be able to say to someone, you are a man. We've just seen at Planet Fitness in the US a woman have her membership revoked for calling out a man for going and shaving in the women's locker room whilst there's a 12-year-old girl sitting in the corner wrapped in a towel, terrified about the fact that there is a man so in there. Let me just come back to that very quickly. Okay. Very briefly. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the whole self-ID movement, if it is a movement, went too far. And I am respectful of women's concerns, some women's concerns, about this whole area, OK? But legally, India Willoughby is a woman, and to 
call her a man is, as I say, I can't find any other language for it other than offensive Matthew, and hateful. Thank you. You've made that point. Look, what we're learning is this is a really controversial issue. Thank you for everyone, particularly Helen, for taking part in the debate here today. And, of course, this law change in Scotland goes way beyond this issue of people's identity and trans. And that's why I say, from my point of view, I think it is quite a chilling new development in terms of people's freedom to speak as they wish. Well, some of you are still getting in touch about...